So welcome to our sixth working session of uh, Contemporary Cultures of India and Latin America. Uh, Ambassador Vishwanathan will take the floor. Thank you, uh, sir. Shall we start? The topic of uh, this session is Contemporary Cultural Connect between India and Latin America. Contemporary. We don't go into the past. Don't ask me. No me preguntas más. Déjanos imaginar que no existe el pasado. Que nacimos al mismo instante en que nos conocimos. <laughs> this, the driving force for this 21st century cultural connect is love. Uh, at least that's what an Argentine friend told me. Amigo Porteño. He explained to me that the Argentine culture has reached a very advanced stage. And he explained to me, he said, the history of the world has evolved like this. In the beginning, Moses stood on the mountain, put his hands here, and said, uh, put his hands up, and said, God, you are omnipotent. You are everything. Then came King Solomon. He put his hands here. Man, use your head. Do justice. Then came Jesus Christ. He put his hands here. Heart, love thy neighbor. Problems will be solved. Then came Karl Marx. He put his hands here. And he said, if this is empty, there will be revolution. And then came Sigmund Freud. So he said, Argentina has reached a Freudian stage. <laughs> <laughs> and he also said there is a distinct characteristic of Argentine culture in comparison to other societies is like this. He said, heaven is a place where the French are the cooks, Germans are the engineers, uh, the uh, British are the policemen, Swiss are the finance managers, and Argentines, of course, are the lovers. And the world will become a hell if it was turned around, if the British became cooks. The French became as engineers, and the Germans became police, and the Swiss became as lovers, unimaginative, and the Argentines becoming finance managers. <laughs> <laughs> the world will go bankrupt. So I tell the Indian businessmen in chambers of commerce that the biggest risk of doing business with the Latin America is falling in love. <laughs> and now the Indian businessmen are even more keen to do, take this risk enthusiastically and courageously. I'll give you a few examples. There were three boys, one from Agra, one from Mumbai, one from Coimbatore. They were recruited by a British company called Mysis, and they were sent to Colombia. They went to Colombia and promptly fell in love with three Colombian girls. And they resigned from the company. They started their own startup called Sofo Solutions, which is doing extremely well. Even Bank Colombia has invested in yeah. that. A friend of mine who runs a mid-cap pharmaceutical company in uh, Chennai, he wanted to uh, explore uh, Central America, where the others have not gone, particularly the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. So he sent his son, young son. And what does the young son do? First thing he does, falls in love with the Guatemalteca, <laughs> marries her. He settled there, and he is doing $200 million of business in Central America. This company called Kaplan Point 
is the largest supplier of pharmaceuticals to Central America. There was a boy from Bihar, Motihari, called Prabhakar Sharan. He wanted to become a Bollywood star. He didn't make it. So he joined a group of youngsters who are going to US illegally. And many of them used this Central American route. He got stuck in Costa Rica without money, passport. He lost everything. He was cheated. So what does he do? He fell in love with a Costa Rican. <laughs> Married her. And she was rich. So after the marriage, the Costa Rican asked her, Tika. She asked her, Pura Vida, my darling, uh, what wedding gift can I give you? So this guy said, you know, my dream was to become a Bollywood actor. I couldn't make it. So I want to act as a hero in a film. No problem. She financed. I made a movie. It's called Enredados la Confusion. Entangle the Confusion. This is the first Spanish film. First Spanish film done in 100% Bollywood formula. He is the hero and it's, it's a Costa Rican film. It became a success. There was a young Brazilian girl called Cecilia Angelon from Sao Paulo. She went to London looking for a job and got a job in a shop run by one Malhotra. And soon, the Cecilia Angelon became Cecilia Malhotra. And she took him to Sao Paulo. And after having conquered the, the Indian man's heart, she thought, why not I try the Indian market? So she wanted to do business with India. So she imp imported henna powder, hair color, which did very well. But after some time, she stopped the import of henna powder. And she started her own brand called Surya Henna Brazil. She started importing raw materials, ingredients from India and made Surya Henna brand, which did very well in Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, went up to New York. She has a business of $20 million. And guess what? She is exporting it to India. <laughs> Another Brazilian took this physical love to the next level, spiritual love. A guy called uh, Janderson Fernandes de Oliveira from Sao Paulo. He used to get dreams when he was young. A wise old man with a beard calling him, come, come to Himalayas. And he got married. He came to India for his honeymoon. And so much of dust, poverty, misery. He didn't like it very much. But anyway, the last part of this uh, trip was to Rishikesh. So he was going from Haridwar to Rishikesh. So when he was going there, he started getting vibrations caused by the ambassador car, plus the pothole roads, <laughs> but also the inner vibration. <laughs> he reached uh, the uh, Rishikesh, and they took him to uh, uh, Swami in an ashram called Satchadam Ashram. And when he saw that guru, he realized he was the one who was appearing in my dreams. So he fell on his feet, surrendered, and then looked at his wife and said, bye-bye, you go back to Brazil. I am becoming a celibate. So he gave up Brahma beer for Ganga Jal. <laughs> and he did so well. He was so authentic. And the uh, fourth guru of this ashram, he was so impressed. When he was about to die, he anointed him as his successor, as the fifth guru. And gave him a new name, Prem Baba. Prem Baba. Now this Prem Baba has taken Indian spiritualism to a new level of business. He is a flying Swami, Jet Set Swami. He has ashrams in 12 countries. Uh, Brazil, Argentina, Israel, Switzerland, United States. And he comes here uh, uh, to uh, Rishikesh uh, uh, three months. And uh, this is how love and business have worked together, synergizing. Now, the Indian businessman has started 
loving Latin America because it has emerged as a good market for our exports. Last year, our exports were $19 billion. And the Indians have realized that despite distance and the so-called barriers, our exports to some of these Latin American countries are much more than India's exports to traditional trading partners and neighbors. Last year, we did $6.5 billion of exports to Brazil, which is more than our exports to Japan or to Thailand. We did $4.5 billion of business uh, exports to Mexico, which is more than our exports to Russia or Canada. To Argentina, Colombia, and Chile, they are in the billion dollar club, over a billion dollars, and Peru uh, is uh, n almost $900 million. It's much more than our exports to Myanmar. We did $552 million of exports to Guatemala, which is more than twice our exports to Cambodia in our neighborhood. It was just $198 million. We did more than two times. This is just in our backyard, 1,000 kilometers, and uh, Guatemala is 15,000 kilometers involving so many shipments and uh, delays. The largest item of India's exports, vehicles, cars and motorcycles. Today, one third of India's global exports of cars go to Latin America. Mexico is the number two destination globally. One third of the motorcycle exports of India go to Latin America. Colombia is the number two. A few years back, they were number one. We have the largest Indian agrochemical company called UPL, United Phosphorus Limited, the largest Indian agrochemical company. Today, they do more business in Brazil than in India. They do $1.5 billion of business in Brazil and across Latin America, $2 billion of business. But in India, they do under a billion dollars. Well, the Latin Americans also love Indian markets. Last year, India's uh, Latin American exports to India was $25 billion. India was the seventh largest destination for Latin American exports. But a few years back in 2014, India was the third largest destination for Latin America's exports after US and China. Now, thanks to the American sanctions, we can't import oil from Venezuela. But more than these dollars and the exports, there is mutual value addition. India considers Latin America as a contributor to India's energy security and food security. 50% of our imports are crude oil. Even if you pass to electrical age, we are going to get lithium. And it's, 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 uh, I think 2014, we imported about 15% of our total Im imports of crude oil from Latin America. Now, Latin America has a large surplus of uh, exportable crude oil, so in the long term, we can buy. Uh, we imported last year $4 billion of vegetable oil, mostly soy oil and some sunflower oil. India is perpetually having a shortage, about 15 million tons every year we import uh, vegetable oil. And we have started importing pulses. So as India is losing more and more agricultural land to urbanization, industrialization, and commercialization, and here is South America, which can feed another 500 million more people. They can bring in another 40 million hectares of land for uh, agriculture. So there is this complementarity. Last year, our imports of gold from Latin America was $6 billion. I think this contributes to India's marital security. <laughs> <laughs> now, on the other side, the Latin Americans see value from India for their health care and human resource development. India exported last year $1.5 billion of generic medicines to Latin America. This has helped millions of poor and middle class Latin Americans to afford medicines. 
it has helped the governments of latin america to reduce their cost of health care it has forced their own companies and the multinationals to bring in more generic medicines earlier they were making more money with branded medicine because of the entry of indian companies today we have two dozen indian it companies bpo and kpo companies they employ about 40000 latin americans across the region now this is not just employment this is a contribution to human resource development of latin america because these companies they train them not only in digital technology but are inculcating a new it culture which has helped india to become an it power so this is the contribution of india to latin america so with all these uh, new synergies and complementarities and the indians and latin americans having discovered the right secret for cultural and business connect which is love love helps you to cross the oceans overcome barriers love conquers all that is the 21st century cultural connect thanks i will stop here i will give the floor to ambassador jorge hein thank you ambassador thank you so much good afternoon it's a real pleasure to be here it's uh, it's about 10 years since i hadn't come and uh, it's a real privilege to be back at the iic a place where I had spent so much time in my years here in, in Delhi. It's also a special pleasure, we were just talking about that, to meet so many friends who we have been in touch virtually. Um, Ambassador Abhai, Ambassador of Bojwani, um, my colleague here, Hari, with whom we have written many pieces in the course of the past 12 years, but had never met in person. And now we have. And of course, Ambassador Vishwanathan, with whom we have been partners in crime in so many ventures that I will not want to go uh, any further into it. And of course, I want to salute the Ambassador of Chile, who is here uh, with us. Uh, let me just say the following. I was given strict instructions by Ambassador Vishwanathan not to go beyond 2000, so I'll stick to that. Um, and I will not get so much into the economic side of U.S., uh, sorry, of uh, Latin America, Indian relations um, that Ambassador Vishwanathan has elaborated on. But uh, let me stick to the uh, politics um, of it, which it seems to me uh, find themselves at a very interesting and important juncture uh, right now. My sense is that we had, in the first decade of this century, a real uptick in the relationship between India and Latin America in a way that had not happened before. President Lula visited India three times. Foreign Minister Amorim used to joke, I spend more time here than I do in Brasilia. He would come uh, all the time. Uh, Chile, of course, had its first presidential visit by President Ricardo Lagos in 2005. Many new embassies were opened. This was the time of IPSA, the time of BRICS, it was a very exciting time. My sense, and this is something we have written about with, with Hari, uh, that the second decade was a bit of a letdown. There were a number of, of reasons for it, but this dynamism that we saw in the first decade did not keep up. And what I would like to uh, propose to you is that there's a remarkable opportunity in this, the third decade, to give a new impetus to the relationship between India and Latin America. Why so? And uh, the reason is, it seems to me, the stars are aligning in a way that uh, will make it possible to see a convergence between India and Latin America in a way that we had not seen for a very long time. And this has to do with the uh, concept that we and several of our colleagues have submitted and that is the notion of active non-alignment. And uh, 
a book that has just been published um, a few weeks ago in London. It's the English edition of the book that we published in Spanish with my colleague Carlos Fortin and Carlos Ominami uh, in November of 2021 uh, with the title El no alimento activo y América Latina, una doctrina para el nuevo siglo. And uh, what is so fascinating to me is that when the book uh, came out and we originally published an article in 2020 and then in 2021, uh, we got quite a bit of criticism. And a number of people, a number of colleagues said, this is, you know, uh, old wine in new bottles. Uh, who cares about non-alignment? This is stuff from the 1950s. I mean, this is 20, you know, the first 21st century. Uh, why are you coming up with these uh, notions? Well, and then something happened. And that is the war in Ukraine. And suddenly, non-alignment is everywhere. And you know, uh, the mainstream press, um, journals of various kinds are saying, non-alignment is back. What is this? Why is this so? Expressing great surprise about this uh, development. And what I would like to share with you very briefly this morning is that it's an extraordinary phenomenon. You have the war in Ukraine, which is a violation of international law, a violation of the Charter of the United Nations. It has brought untold suffering to uh, many people. And you know, the position of the United States, of the European Union, has been very clear of the G7, not just in condemning it, but in trying to make this a global war in which everybody should participate. Now, what I find extremely revealing is that Latin America, although the uh, vast majority of countries have condemned the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, have refused to go along with the latter of becoming part of this, of this conflict. And you see it in the various votes that have taken place in the United Nations. Uh, you see it also in the almost unanimous refusal on backing the economic and political sanctions that have been imposed by uh, the G7 on Russia. And recently we had the most uh, significant episode in this, it seems to me, Chancellor Scholz of uh, Germany made a tour of Latin America. And the purpose of this tour was to convince countries like Chile, like Argentina, like Brazil, that they should send tanks and fighter jets to Ukraine. This was rejected unanimously. Why? You know, Latin America has no dog in that fight. It has no iron in that fire. Why should it get involved in a European war that is a European war? It's a terrible thing. But there are many wars around the world. There's a war in Yemen. Nobody has made Yemen a global war in which the aggressor should be isolated and should be withdrawn from the banking system and all sorts of embargoes applied against. That has not happened. Why not? Because it isn't happening in Europe. And uh, uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar has this wonderful uh, quotation that I've used uh, in an article of mine in which he said, the time is long past that for Europe to consider that Europe's problems are the world's problems, but the world's problems are not Europe's problems. And it seems to me that sums up very well uh, what is happening. And in uh, Latin America, what we are seeing more and more is that the main countries, the leading countries in Latin America, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, are refusing to endorse this position that this should become a global war, that somehow all countries around the world should you know, provide tanks and jet fighters and so on to Ukraine. It's a very tragic war. And the reaction, uh, this is also extremely revealing. It, it goes just to the point of our argument that uh, active non-alignment is the way forward. President Lula was recently in, in Washington, D.C. He gets along very well with President Biden, 
whom he had known uh, for a long time, from the days he was president and President Biden was vice president. President Biden famously was one of the very first presidents who called President Lula, breaking the established protocol in the United States. Immediately after uh, it was announced that President Lula had won the election, they share many concerns. They talked about the Amazon. They talk about uh, protecting democratic institutions, uh, and you know, which were under threat both in the United States and in Brazil by both of their respective predecessors. But there's one thing on which they disagreed, and that was the Ukraine war. And President Lula has gone so far as to say that he wants an international mediation to bring an end to the war, mm? uh, which again you know, took many people by <laughs> surprise, since the attitude in some quarters seems to be to continue with the war to weaken Russia permanently. And that's a quote, uh, which again, many uh, governments, many countries, many people in the global south see no reason for that to continue the war. So what is active uh, non-alignment all about? And why has it become such a significant uh, notion in this past year? Um, a review of the book in Foreign Affairs referred to it as the most significant foreign policy development in the region since the end of the Cold War. Uh, foreign policy uh, referred to in a, in a review of a balance of the year 2022 that Latin America, for Latin America, 2022 was the year of non-alignment. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we mean by it and why is it significant? Taking a page from non-alignment as it was put forward by Jawaharlal uh, Nehru in the 1950s, we adapted to the uh, needs, to the priorities of the 21st century. And what it does is to say countries take their own national interest as the guiding post. They will not allow themselves to be pushed into aligning automatically, either with Washington or with Beijing or with Moscow or with Brussels for that matter. And that is exactly what has happened. It's remarkable, I don't know whether you follow this, but basically sort of the only continuity in foreign policy that exists between the government of President Bolsonaro and President Lula is this, that they refuse to get involved into what is seen as a European war that needs to be uh, solved, that needs to be brought to an end, but in which Latin American countries should not get involved as there is no reason for it. Now, what active non-alignment does is to say countries need to work together, puts an emphasis on greater regional cooperation, greater regional coordination, puts an emphasis on multilateralism, but it also, and this is very important, puts an emphasis on the active side, by which is meant that diplomacy is especially important. It is very easy to say, okay, I will do what Washington tells me, or I will do what Beijing tells me. Well, for that you don't need much analysis. But if you have to evaluate each situation on their merits and say, in this particular case, we're going this way, in this other case, we're going this other way, that is a much more demanding task. It puts a very heavy burden on foreign ministries on getting it right. And this, it seems to me, is a, a very significant challenge that we are facing in Latin America. So summing up, what I would like to convey to you is that here we have one of the most distinguished traditions in Indian uh, foreign policy that is now being adapted to the needs of the 21st century by Latin American countries. And, there, and this is not an abstract uh, question. There are very concrete situations in which Latin American countries in the past few years have seen themselves pushed, in some cases, very significant projects have come to an end because of the tension between, in this case, China and the United States. There was a, a project to build a submarine cable from Chile to China, from Valparaiso to Shanghai, that I presented myself to the Chinese government when I was ambassador, 
that was cancelled because Secretary of State Pompeo visited uh, Santiago and read the riot act to the Chilean government. That project came to an end. There have been projects in Panama, the dimensions of Panama here. Panama at one point had a number of very significant infrastructure projects with Chinese companies going on. Several of them uh, have been put on ice for the same reason. So this is a very concrete and material issue that demands for Latin American countries to make up their minds, to take a stance, and to look ahead in a constructive fashion. In that sense, it seems to me that the reaction that we have seen in India on the war in Ukraine, many expected, you know, because of the this whole notion of the Indo-Pacific, of the Quad, of you know the uh, chemistry that developed and the visits that were exchanged between uh, President Trump and, and Prime Minister Modi, that India would side with the G7 and would side with Washington on the question of uh, the war in Ukraine. And India has not done that. And it seems to me, if we look at other countries around the global south, you know, the argument has been made that the war in Ukraine reflects the main cleavage in the international system today. And that would be between democracy and autocracy, between democracy and authoritarianism. Well, with India, Indonesia, mm -hmm. Pakistan, South Africa, Brazil, I mean, these are some of the largest democracies in the world. And they are not siding with the G7. They are not siding with Washington or with Brussels. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us, it seems to me, quite clearly, that the main cleavage in the international system today is not between democracy and autocracy. It is between North and South. It is between the global North and the global South. And you know, people congratulate themselves on, on the fact that NATO has been reinforced by the war, that the G7 is stronger than ever, and that that would be a significant result of the war, all of which is true. Now, the G7 represents less than one billion people in the world. It's a small sliver of humanity. Somewhere around 18, 85% of the people that live in this world do so in countries that are not backing sanctions on Russia, that are taking a different position, and they don't want to get involved in the war. And if they did, so it's for bringing about peace and for mediation. And that, it seems to me, is the core of what active non-alignment is about. I'm already getting little messages <laughs> from <laughs> Ambassador Vishwanathan. So uh, I leave it at that. Um, the book has just come out. Uh, we'll have a, a launch at JNU on Friday. And I'm really excited to be uh, in India at this time as this convergence between India and Latin America is taking place. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we have got a 21st century political tool for connection between India and Latin America. But before we go into the 21st century business connect, let me tell you a 21st century Tamil theory about India and Latin America. Uh, there is a Tamil book with the title Ten America Tamilar Hal. Ten America Tamilar Hal. It means South American Tamils. So, according to this book, Columbus discovering uh, America was a fake news. Uh, it was done by the Tamils before Christ. And the Aztecs and Mayas and Walmers are actually our cousins. And I, 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 I was very intrigued. I talked to the author. And he said he's going to write another book this time. He says uh, the title is going to be uh, Chola Empire in South America. <laughs> so who says uh, magical realism is from Latin America only? Javier.
Hello, everyone. I would like to uh, start by thanking uh, IIC and ICCR for the invitation. And uh, today I would like to talk to you about the story. It's not a love story like the ones Ambassador Vishwanathan was talking about. Though I must confess that I myself, after being 12 years in this country, have fallen in love with India. So this is a story about a Latin American company who opened and had operations in India, and in particular is a Mexican company who have been in India for the past 16 years. Now let me tell you a little bit about Cinepolis for those of you who are not uh, uh, that familiar with the company. Uh, Cinepolis is a privately held company founded in Mexico in 1971, so roughly We've been in the market for 50 years. Uh, it took us 30 years to go outside of Mexico. Our first ever incursion outside of Mexico was in 2003 to Central America, which was the natural expansion for a Mexican company. We continued to um, expand south to Latin America and all of a sudden, we decided to come to India in 2007. It took us two years to open our first cinema in India, but back then it didn't, uh, it seemed that it didn't make much sense for a Mexican company to come to the other side of the world to make such investment. Uh, we continued expanding. We opened in Brazil by 2010, in the US. Uh, in 2017, we came to uh, Middle East and uh, later in 2018, we opened uh, in Indonesia. Now, Cinepolis, in terms of number of screens, is the third largest operator in the world, uh, just after AMC and uh, Cineworld, which unfortunately just filed for bankruptcy uh, recently, but we're the third largest in terms of number of screens. However, in number of tickets sold, we're the second largest in the world with over 330 million tickets sold. This is pre-pandemic. We had a, a, a couple of terrible years, 2020 and 21. However, we're back in the business. We survived and uh, we expect to, to, to um, you know, retake and regain uh, the heights that we had before pandemic. And in terms of efficiency, which is tickets per screen were number one in the world when we compare to the rest of the public companies in the top 10. As mentioned, in 2019, we had 364 million tickets sold in 19 countries in four different continents. Those are, the, this, that's the breakdown of um, the, the countries where we operate. Mexico continues to be our largest market uh, with uh, two-thirds of the business, roughly. However, India is now the second largest market for Cinepolis in the world. And, you know, all the macroeconomic indicators and the potential that this country has, eventually we expect India to take over and, and, and continue to gain importance within the company's portfolio. This is just a map to show the, the geographical presence of Cinepolis, as mentioned, uh, 19 countries, uh, four different countries. However, we can see that the main presence of the company is uh, still in Latin America. Now let me tell you a little bit about the Indian exhibition industry. Yesterday we talked about, or we heard uh, about Latin American cinema. Now, this is about uh, the Indian cinema exhibition industry, not from the content side, but rather from the uh, movie theater's point of view. And with this graph, what I want to portray is the following. Uh, the bar, the, the blue part of the bar is the single screens that continue to exist in this country, 
uh, is, is, is an exception in the world. In most of the other places, uh, single screens no longer exist. It, uh, only multiplexes with the modern technologies uh, exist, but however in India they continue to exist. And the red portion of the bar is the multiplexes or the modern cinemas in which Cinepolis uh, takes part of. So when we see the total number of screens in India, for the past 10 years it continues to be the same. It's around uh, 10,000, it had uh, come down to 9,500, but roughly we can say that continues to be the same. However, the single screens have gone down uh, from 9,000 to 6,000, and the multiplex screens have gone up from 1,000 to 3,000, which can tell us about you know, the future. What we expect is that the multiplex screens will continue to replace the single screens in India as is, it has happened in the rest of the world. Also in terms of admissions and in terms of box office, multiplexes have taken over single screens. In terms of admissions, the multiplexes have, continue, have grown in an average yearly of 11%. And in terms of box office, the, the, the multiplex box office has grown at an average of 20, over 20% 20 per year. So multiplex screens in India, although they represent around 40% of the installed capacity in terms of number of screens, they take almost half or rather more than half of the box office. Um, because the ticket price of the single of the multiplexes is much higher than single screens. And when we talk about the potential of India, this graph shows you the number of people per installed screen. At the far uh, left, you can see the US. So in the US there are there's one cinema screen for eight for every eight thousand people. In India, the number is, there's one uh, screen for every 150,000 people. And that is including both single screens and multiplexes. If we were only to talk about multiplex screens, there is one multiplex screen for every 500,000 people in this country, which talks and gives perspective of the potential that we, uh, that we have in this particular country. When we talk about Latin America, you know, there's uh, anything between 20 to uh, 40,000 uh, people per screen, which we believe could be the number towards that what India could point at. And the number of titles that are released, the number of movies that are released in this country is uh, enormous and needless to say that it's not only Bollywood what we're talking about there are series of uh, regional cinema industries uh, mainly in South India but also in, in, in uh, Punjab or uh, Gujarat or even in Assam that contribute to have over 1,000 movies released every year compared to uh, you know, a couple of hundred that may, uh, may be released in Latin America and even in the U.S. Uh, as we also saw yesterday, India is one exception in the world in terms of how uh, the consumption of cinema from Hollywood. Hollywood in India is, I wouldn't say negligible, but it's, it's uh, you know, less than 15% of the box office. Indians love local cinema, which is great. And unfortunately, that is not the case for Latin America. I won't get into the detail, but you can see sorted out the countries in which we operate. Uh, the blue bar represents Hollywood, and the orange bar represents the local content. Uh, at the bottom is India, in which, you know, over 80% of the box office comes from 
local content. And uh, in Latin America, the, 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 the countries at the top, in which you know, over 95% of the box office come from Hollywood. Even in countries with uh, government intervention uh, that unsuccessfully have been able to push the local content to the, 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 the screens. And to give a little more specifics on the topic, for last year, if we compare the top 10 movies in Mexico and in India, you see in, in orange the is the titles has are not as important, but orange is Hollywood content, whereas blue is local content. So out of the ten top the, the top ten movies in Mexico, which I'm sure is the same in, in all Latin America, the ten of them are from Hollywood. Whereas in India the top ten eight of them are local. And not only that, the first three of the Indian uh, movies are not even from Bollywood. Two of them are Canada, uh, and one of them is Telugu. So uh, that's how important regional uh, cinema is uh, in, in, in this country. Now, if we s uh, see that the number of, this is um, an indicator that we use in the industry which tell us how many people come per screen per week. And again, I'm not trying to go into the detail of this, but what I'm trying to tell you is that when we compare the number of people who, uh, who come to the, to the cinema in India compared to Latin America on a per screen basis, it's drastically different. Twice as many people come to India. I mean, India really love cinema, they come on a per screen basis twice more than what, it com what, it, what they do in, in Latin America. The average that we had before pandemic in India was around 2,500 people every uh, week per screen, whereas in Latin America we were talking about 1,000. So it's less than half of it. That way this is, this is how cinemas look in India. This is uh, something that would never happen in Latin America. When my colleagues from the headquarters have come to, to India, we have faced, I mean, when we visit cinemas, we used to go to every single auditorium, sit for five minutes to watch the movie. So we have gone to our cinemas and found no seat available. In, in none of the studios, because you know, they are 100% occupied. So that's how it looks. And it's not only in terms of number of people, but also the behavior of the people, which could be quite original in India. <laughs> and let me show you a very brief clip. Not Patan, but I had a video of Patan as well. So for those of you not that familiar with, with, with this, what they are throwing to the screen is at, uh, uh, notes, money. So, uh, the story of Cinepolis in India is, you know, uh, has been rising, is, is, is important, we have been successful. Uh, we are still the, the first and only cinema operating country in the country, we're the third largest in India. We changed the paradigm of having many screens in one place called Megaplex and still have uh, important expansion plans. And to, uh, to finish, I would like to talk about the challenges that we faced. And uh, 
I focused on the exogenous challenges that we have faced. And uh, first of all is that the growth has not been as ambitious as we, uh, as we would have liked. And that is because the real estate uh, industry has you know, limited the, the, the expansion for cinemas. It's not easy to uh, make a shopping center operational in this country. And since most of, mega of multiplexes open in, in um, shopping centers, that's what uh, has limited the uh, growth for the industry. Second, high rentals. Uh, you know, everyone who, um, who has been here for some time know that the cost of land in this country is extremely high. India is the country in which we operate that we pay the highest rents in absolute amount of money uh, in spite of having a rather low ticket price. Uh, in some states, particularly in South, we have price regulation. The, the, the price of the ticket, cinema ticket, is controlled by the government, which, you know, uh, we don't have uh, much flexibility. And uh, last is uh, red tape. We uh, have 70, uh, 70 cinemas in 20 different states. We have municipal licenses, state licenses, national licenses, uh, up to 50 different licenses per cinema. Some of them that have to be renewed every quarter, some of them twice a year, some of them yearly, which makes it over 5,000 different licenses we have to go through every single year, which opens, of course, uh, opportunities for corruption and you know practices that we should not uh, be part of, and that has prevented you know, different cinemas of ours to be shut down for months or even years, trying to solve problems of uh, a license. I have to say that in the 15 years that we have been here, this has we feel how uh, India has improved. Um, when we look at the World Bank's ease of doing business rank, India has gone from uh, the place 140 or 120 something to the place 60, still good way to, to, to go. However, we see how uh, it has improved and uh, it will continue to improve. That's what we expect uh, so that we can continue being here, expanding and uh, nurturing this love story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cinema is another 21st century connect between India and Latin America. As a Mexican actress called Barbara Mori, she acted with Ritikesh Roshan in a film called Kites. As a Brazilian called Giselle Montero, she acted with the Indian actor Cajo Napiar. And people did not know they were Mexicans and Brazils because of the Café Con Leche skin color. <laughs> but uh, it's going further. Rajnikanth went with Aishwarya Rai to dance on Machu Picchu. The, historically, this is the first time and the last time there is a dance on a sacred mountain, uh, Machu Picchu. And the Tamils got the permission somehow. Allu Arjun, the famous Telugu actor, he danced on the uh, Salar the Uyuni, uh, uh, salt uh, lakes of uh, uh, Bolivia. So Indians are going to Latin American sites for films. There is an Argentine called Gustavo Santaolaya. He composed the music for Dobi Ghat, Amir Khan's film. So it is a new connect. Next. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks uh, IRC for bringing, up, bringing so many Latin Americans together here. It's been a long time since we had a conference on Latin America in Delhi. And I'm happy to be on the panel with uh, three Latin Americans who have a very deep, real connection with India. Uh, Soraya was the first and probably the only Latin American to do a PhD on India-Latin America relations here and then run a center on South Asia. And Javier uh, from Cinepolis 
he did not mention this in his talk, but Cinepolis is the largest Latin American investor in India right now. Um, and of course, Jorge Hain came as ambassador and made a very big difference to India-Chile relations, and I'm very glad to have worked with him before. And I'm sure a lot of people here have worked with and been inspired by Ambassador Vishwanathan. So taking inspiration from him, I have included in my in the beginning of this uh, talk, I'm going to start with a few personal examples, which is something he also always does that keeps people's attention. So the first one is uh, Jasbel Singh. Jasbel Singh sounds like a very Indian, very Punjabi name. Yeah. But she grew up speaking two languages at home, primarily Spanish, and the second one, a little bit of Punjabi. She came to India to learn English. Yeah, Why is that? Because she's from the north of Argentina. There's a very small population of Punjabis and Sikhs who live in Salta in northern Argentina. So her parents had immigrated to Argentina, and she was born and brought up there. She has been working on India. She has spoken about the Indian diaspora in Latin America at The Hague in the Netherlands. She is part of a new generation of young politicians in Argentina. So she's part of a political party in Argentina. Yeah. The second one is uh, Rodrigo Blanco. He's a former Mexican diplomat and commercial officer who worked at the embassy here in India. But he's not a typical diplomat. Yeah. Normally, diplomats come, they stay here for a few years, and you go back. Of course, there are some exceptions even here. We have the Peruvian ambassador who's come back after already being here uh, for about eight years. So Rodrigo also stayed here for 10 years. He stayed here for a decade, trying to get more investment from India to Mexico. He went, traveled all over the country, and he made quite a difference to uh, that relationship. And since the past three years, he is heading corporate affairs for an Indian IT company in Latin America. So for TCS, he's the corporate affairs manager for the entire region. Yeah. The third one is uh, Arun, who's a Malayali living in, whose family has been living in Chennai for two generations. He, like many typical uh, IT workers in India, started working in the IT sector in Chennai. He worked for two years, and the company offered him an option to go to either Argentina or China. And he chose Argentina. Why? Because I heard a lot about tango, about Argentine football. So I was, more cu I was curious to learn more. Yeah? So Arun went in 2011. He's still in Argentina. He's doing his international MBA in Spanish at an Argentine university. And he's very active with the embassy as well. He was the master of ceremonies for the uh, 75th uh, Independence Day celebrations of India just some time back. The fourth is uh, Elano. Elano is a Brazilian footballer. He was part of the Indian Super League for two years, yeah, 2014 and 2015, the inaugural editions of the Indian Super League, which is a football league in India, because India is trying to promote football, right? promote sports in general. And it's not a coincidence that a Brazilian was the top scorer in the first edition of the Indian Super League. right? In the second ed edition, his teammate, a Colombian, was the top scorer. And his team, Chennai, they won the Indian Super League. The last of the five examples is myself. Yeah. Um, I went to Peru in 2008. I stayed there for two years, and uh, I have not left the region in terms of my career since then. And I don't think I will in the near future as well. But the reason I'm giving this example is because what took me to Peru was ISEC. So it's a youth organization that is in India, and I, at least at that time it was in 120 countries. Now maybe a little bit more. So ISEC gave me the opportunity to live and work in Peru at a young age of 20, right? 
So it left a very big impression on me. Now, the reason I brought up these examples is because each of them is part of a larger picture. Yeah? So Jazbel was part of the ITEC program. That's the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program. All of the Indian embassies around the world, but also the ones in Latin America, have a specific number, a quota of people that they have to send or they would like to send from Latin America to India for short periods of time for either technical or educational training. Yeah? So Jasbel was part of this program, and so are many others who keep coming from the region to India. Yeah? I was part of ISEC. ISEC, I assume, till today may have had at least 2,000 people between India and Latin America work in, uh, so Indians going to the region and Latin Americans coming here. I was in charge of sending people abroad, and I myself, uh, in one year, we had sent about 12 people from India to different Latin American countries. The two other examples, Arun and Rodrigo, are part of a huge IT sector, right? So you have Indian companies, about uh, 15 or so Indian companies, that employ 40,000 people in the region. So these numbers may not figure too much in the trade data, right? But they make a very big difference to Latin American countries, where most uh, countries in South America, perhaps with the exception of Brazil, uh, are dependent on commodities. So when you have IT companies from India creating such a big uh, employment workforce and giving opportunities in value-added sectors, the Latin Americans also see it as a big positive step. Right? So Arun and Rodrigo are part of that bigger ecosystem of 40,000 people, which I'm sure will increase in the coming days. Football. Of course, a lot of Indians, in, especially in Kerala and West Bengal, are crazy about Latin American football, specifically Brazil and Argentinian football. And you could have seen even now when Argentina won the World Cup, even before that, you had people in Kerala sitting at 12.30 uh, a.m. matches, right, starting at midnight. You have about 20,000 people uh, outside celebrating, right? So Elano was one of 72 Latin American football players who have come to the ISL, to the Indian Super League. Yeah? And I'm sure that number will also keep increasing. Now I'm going to move to the demographic part of the presentation. I have put across two comparing population pyramids. Right? First you have India and Latin America. They look almost the same almost the same in terms of the number of people in these countries in different age brackets, right? So the majority of people are young, which is why the median age in India is about 28. The median age in Latin America is just about 30 or a little bit less, 29.8 or so. In some countries, like Brazil, it is 33, but in most of the other countries, it's either 30 or less. Now, this is in big contrast to Europe and the US, where the median age of most of the population is closer to 40. Yeah? Even China, the median age is 39. So what does this mean? This means that India and Latin America, with this young demographic, have a lot of, they face a lot of similar challenges. Right? So you have a lot of young people who need jobs. So our companies, our governments have to be capable to create and promote job creation. And there is some way for us to learn from each other as well. Right? And these are also growing consumer economies. The reason why, as Ambassador Vishwanathan said, you have a lot of Indian companies going to Brazil, selling pharmaceutical products in the IT sector, is also because we have similar requirements. TCS needs to create jobs in India, and they need to create, they want to take advantage of the Latin American market to create jobs there as well, right? So we face a lot of similar challenges in this socio-economic aspect. Now, there's one thing that India can also learn a lot from uh, Latin America. And this is in terms of the youth in politics, yeah? 
I'm not sure if you can see all of those numbers, but the one that's darker, percentage of parliamentarians who are under 45 years old. In India, it is 20%. The global average is closer to, sorry, 20%. The global average is closer to 30%. In a lot of Latin American countries, Mexico, for example, is almost 45. Chile is 45. So you have 45% of parliamentarians who are under the age of 45. Yeah? I believe this is something India should change and should learn from uh, Latin America. Latin America also has two presidents who are millennials. Um, and I wanted to use this word because that also ties in all the five examples I mentioned. All five, Rodrigo, Elano, uh, Jasbel, Arun, and myself are all millennials. We are born in the 1980s. Yeah? And you have two presidents in El Salvador and Chile who are also born in the 1980s. Yeah? So the representation of the youth who also understand exactly what are the issues that are important for a majority of the country there right? Um, also matters. So in India's case, 50% of India's population is under 30 years old. Yeah? So you need more representation. I feel that India can learn from Latin America in this respect. And I found one really fascinating thing. Even older Latin American politicians, so in Argentina, the current president, uh, Alberto Fernandez, and also some older candidates who have stood for presidential elections, they campaigned on a platform called Twitch. I don't know how many people in this room have even heard of Twitch. Yeah, I would assume uh, not more than maybe 15% or so, right? So Twitch is a social media platform that you don't really use to talk to each other, but you used to watch other people playing games, doing videos. So the Argentine president campaigned on Twitch. Yeah? And you have in this election in Brazil, the two people, candidates who got the most votes, one actually, in fact, Nicolas Ferreira has got the most votes of, in the history of uh, Brazilian elections for one candidate. He's 26 years old. Yeah? And the other guy, Guillermo Bulos, is 27 years old. And he also, he was a nobody until he started campaigning on Twitch. And other candidates also learned from him. So to conclude, I believe a lot of what I just spoke about, uh, the youth, the demographic profile, the similarities we have here, will play a role and are already playing a role in changing this perception. And as the uh, word that Ambassador Vishwanathan used correctly implies contemporary, right? They are creating a more contemporary understanding of India in Latin America and of Latin Americans here. I, for the paper that we wrote for IIC, I also included one small section on Bollywood, uh, which is already mentioned here. So you have a lot of new uh, elements that are being infused into this India-Latin America relationship. And Abhay, who's sitting here, you know, he is a, uh, an example of the synergy of some of the old elements like Rabindranath Tagore, Octavio Paz, uh, literature and poetry that we used to have so much that most people um, who studied Latin America in India uh, in the past 30, 40 years have been acquainted with. Abhay has written and also traveled all over the region um, and is known as an Indian poet in Latin America. Right? So to conclude, you know, I think the future of uh, uh, this India-Latin America relationship may not be in the hands of the youth, but they are playing some role in shaping it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Hari is the exception to my theory about the risk of falling in love. <laughs> no Peruvian girl was lucky. And here is the lucky one, India. Uh, but in future, there are more Indians who are going to take interest in Latin America than ever because today Spanish has replaced French as the most popular foreign language in India. 
There are hundreds of schools in India where they teach Spanish. And these kids, when they come up, they are going to take more interest. OK, next. Buenas tardes a todos. Um, yes, I'm going to speak in Spanish. Uh, after six years living here, Indians told me that language is its identity and its power, and uh, also is the easy way to express uh, your ideas faster. So I, since I have only 15 minutes, I'm going to, to speak in Spanish. So uh, what you are uh, looking at the screen, este es Usme, Uzmekistán, el puente de la dignidad. Uzme es una localidad de Bogotá con 748 mil habitantes localizados en mil hectáreas, en su mayoría personas muy pobres. Es una de las entradas vitales y estratégicas a la capital que conecta el sur de Colombia. El 70% de Uzme es rural, pero tiene una fuerte concentración de negocios populares y microempresariales. Es un lugar en el, en el que las opciones juveniles son limitadas, economía informal, drogas, violencia. Usme fue uno de los centros de los acontecimientos en 2022. Ese puente inspiró esta investigación que cursa en este momento en CECICAM, en el Centro de Estudios sobre India Contemporánea y Asia Meridional, en la Universidad Externada de Colombia. Por el relacionamiento de esos jóvenes muy pobres con lugares de Asia que ellos no conocen, pero que consideran cercanos a sus revoluciones. El 19 de julio de junio de 2022, Colombia eligió por mayoría incuestionable al primer gobierno de izquierda en más de 200 años de historia republicana. Somos una nación difícil de entender, reconocida por su cercanía a las ideas globalizadoras con gran fuerza creativa, a la vez conservadora, socia de, poten, de las potencias tradicionales y precavida en su relación con el resto del mundo. Sus élites prefieren mirar hacia adentro, a no ser que haya intereses afuera. La victoria de Petro es entonces un cambio de discurso y de actitud, que genera incertidumbre y que como todos los cambios radicales, desacomoda incluso a sus votantes. Colombia es la cuarta economía de Latinoamérica, a pesar de estar inmersa en conflictos violentos de diverso tipo durante casi un siglo. Es uno de los países con mayor diversidad de la tierra, pero deriva buena parte de su supervivencia de una economía extractiva, empobrecedora y baja en valor agregado. Es un país de renta media, miembro de la OCDE, pero se clasifica como la segunda economía más desigual de la región. El viraje de Colombia a la izquierda se recibió positivamente incluso por partidos de centro. Gustavo Petro ganó con más de 11 millones de sufragios, la votación más alta obtenida por un líder de izquierda. Esa victoria se le debe en gran parte a la lucha de los jóvenes en las manifestaciones de los meses anteriores, quienes gritaron un creciente inconformismo con el modelo económico, con la corrupción y con la ausencia de oportunidades. En las elecciones presidenciales de 2022, el 19% de los votantes lo hizo por primera vez, es decir, eran jóvenes, mientras que el 50% no tenía afinidad política, luego manifestaban querer un cambio. Los jóvenes vienen cumpliendo con el deber democrático de ir a las urnas, pero también lo, lo hacen, hacen su propia publicidad, sostienen sin recursos de, del Estado sus sedes políticas, 
llaman a través de sus redes a salir a las calles, dan discusiones serias aunque aún no exentas de clichés y conforman comités directivos y decisorios. Pero como ustedes lo ven en la pantalla, hay otra cara de los acontecimientos, desgarradora, angustiosa, jóvenes de todos los estratos sociales enardecidos y sin mucha esperanza. Las movilizaciones se convirtieron en escenarios de violencia de jóvenes contra jóvenes, de destrucción de la infraestructura de las ciudades, grupos violentos, armados e ilegales infiltrando las movilizaciones, los sistemas de transporte resultaron muy afectados, los bancos, las iglesias, las universidades fueron atacados e integrantes del movimiento juvenil denominado la primera línea que copó la fracción más radical y que duró meses en protestas y bloqueos, prácticamente invadió los barrios residenciales. ¿De, un, ¿De dónde? ¿De dónde surge tanto inconformismo? Colombia es un país con cerca de 50 millones de habitantes, 28% son jóvenes entre 14 y 28 años, el 76% habita en las ciudades y el 24% en las zonas rurales. Esa tasa de, la tasa de desempleo entre la población juvenil en 2021 llegó al 21% y el año pasado al 19%. La falta de oportunidades, como siempre, afecta a las mujeres. La tasa eh, de mujeres sin trabajo fue de 23%, mientras que la de los hombres jóvenes de 15%. Otro indicador crítico para Colombia hace referencia a la tasa de deserción de la educación secundaria, es decir, de high school. Se llegó a 3% para los hombres y 2% para las mujeres y 2% para, las, para los hombres mientras el porcentaje de quienes lograron pasar a la universidad fue solo del 39%, mientras el porcentaje de cobertura de la educación fue del 53%, es decir, seguimos sin una buena educación para nuestra población. Ahora bien, un dato triste y que nos toca a todos en la modernidad global, es el de los jóvenes que ni estudian ni trabajan. La OCDE en 2022 estimó que en 2021 el 31% de los jóvenes colombianos pertenecían a esa población. Ocupamos el cuarto lugar en el mundo y el segundo en Latinoamérica después de Brasil. ¿Por qué Colombia se expresa? Porque el país, pese a sus dificultades e imperfecciones, es la democracia más estable de América Latina, dueña de una larga historia contestataria. Si analizamos la línea de tiempo, elaborada por el Centro de Investigaciones de, de Paz del CINEP sobre las luchas sociales en Colombia, en 1975, de 1975 a 2019 se registran un promedio de movimientos sociales en un rango de 305 a 112 movilizaciones anuales, lo que con, constata la, propens, la propensión de la pro, a la protesta del pueblo colombiano y la participación siempre activa de los grupos juveniles. En ese periodo, tres momentos marcaron la historia de Colombia. En 1977 se llevó a cabo el primer paro cívico nacional y en él los jóvenes lograron incrementar el salario básico en un 9% y una reforma al sistema de educación que permitió la categorización de los maestros. Entre 1986 y 1990, ustedes recordarán, los vectores de violencia y miedo eran mayúsculos en Colombia. La guerra contra el narcotráfico estaba en su punto más álgido y el terrorismo se tomó las calles y el campo, lo que desencadenó en la toma del Palacio de Justicia por la guerrilla del M-19, dejando un saldo de 11 magistrados de la Corte asesinados, cinco de ellos de la universidad que hoy represento, 20 servidores públicos muertos y decenas de desaparecidos. Más tarde el asesinato del candidato presidencial Luis Carlos Galán a manos del narcotráfico, también cambió la historia de Colombia. Los jóvenes salieron y a instancia de los partidos tradicionales pidieron una Asamblea Nacional Constituyente. El resultado, la Constitución de 1991, una de las más modernas de América Latina, que en su artículo 45 reconoce a los jóvenes y les permite crear escenarios para la formulación e implementación de políticas dedicadas a su grupo. Seguimos con la línea de tiempo en 2015, entre 2015 y 2019. 
tienen lugar eventos muy dolorosos para Colombia. Después de un proceso de paz de más de tres años, un referendo para aprobar el acuerdo con la guerrilla de las FARC se pierde en favor del no, con una mayoría exigua. El proceso, sin embargo, el proceso de paz con las FARC se salva. Hoy me perdí. Y se señala un hito. No obstante, la derecha vuelve a gobernar intentando parar a Petro, que también había sido candidato en esa oportunidad, y se verifica la profundización de la desigualdad y de las brechas sociales, porque se ahonda en el modelo neoliberal que durante décadas impidió el desarrollo de Colombia y que nos llevó a importar hasta nuestro propio maíz. Se rearman los grupos disidentes de las guerrillas que se financian con el narcotráfico y los jóvenes de las villas y de Usme vuelven a ser vinculados a los grupos violentos y son desplazados a las grandes ciudades. Así como he presentado datos que dejarían pues, una imagen de Colombia en claro, oscuro, en claro oscuro, es oportuno explicar que la nación y su juventud son una de las potencias culturales a escala global. Hablo del país con mayor número de grupos teatrales de la región y con el festival de teatro más importante del mundo en desarrollo. Les doy el perfil de una nación donde hay una inter, un intérprete musical en cada familia y alguien que cultiva las letras en cada barrio de una sociedad donde la literatura se aprende desde la casa, los jóvenes artistas colombianos llegan a los, a los escalafones del Billboard y de los premios Grammy. Tal fenómeno es sus, es, en la superestructura es reflejo de la nación con mayor biodiversidad biológica del mundo y con una multietnicidad que se distribuye en cinco ecosistemas mayores que conforman la segunda geografía más compleja de la Tierra. No obstante, el movimiento juvenil no es uniforme, hay tendencias, como siempre en la izquierda. Se unieron en 2022 en torno a Petro, sin embargo hay dudas sobre si el presidente logra, logrará mantener la alianza. Hace una semana salieron a las calles de manera dividida, los unos preocupados por los temas citados, los otros inquietos por la pérdida relativa de espacio de las élites tradicionales en la política. Hay un escenario en el que convergen y eso le debe interesar a India y en general al Asia. La juventud colombiana respalda las políticas de tránsito y de una economía extractiva a una basada en el conocimiento y la tecnología para agregar valor, diversificar y sofisticar y es aquí donde surgen preguntas. ¿Saben los jóvenes colombianos qué quieren? Los jóvenes de ayer enfrentaban más carencias materiales de movilidad y de conectividad. Los jóvenes de hoy son bombardeados con posibilidades de conexión y relacionamiento espontáneo que generan un gran cúmulo de frustraciones materiales y espirituales. ¿Cómo puede el Estado y la academia interpretar las necesidades de esa población para hacerla converger con la inmediatez de la posmodernidad y con la necesidad de desarrollo inclusivo? Frente a la deserción en el proceso de formación, ¿qué clase de oferta educativa ofrecer? ¿Cursos elementales de 30 horas virtuales o metodologías robustas que incluyan a las entidades del Estado y al empresariado en un proceso de formación que se ocupe de la integración regional, transregional, en favor de las economías de los pueblos del sur global? Creo que de eso se trata la segunda parte del título de lo que hoy nos convoca, Share Present. Sigo siendo docente y una nueva posición laboral me honra, el presidente Petro me ha designado como su asesora en el Consejo Superior de Comercio Exterior, un órgano encargado de fijar la política comercial y de competitividad de mi país. Desde ahí pienso en una, se piensa en una política de reindustrialización de Colombia, la primera en décadas y que incluye una inédita estrategia hacia el Asia, me imagino entonces escenarios concretos en los que los jóvenes indios y colombianos pueden encontrar un destino más coherente. Colombia está comprometida en asegurar en el mediano plazo su reindustrialización, la del agro y la seguridad alimentaria, industrialización en el sector farmacéutico y cobertura total de la calidad en salud, transición energética y cuidado de las fuentes hídricas, transferencia de conocimiento y tecnología a través de las compras del Estado de la Defensa Nacional. Yo no sé, pero eh, en estas cuatro áreas 
India está presente. Claro, es una industria que debe pasar de comercializar y expandirse a integrarse a producir en el territorio colombiano. Debe pasar a agregar más valor en, bajo un concepto de beneficio mutuo y desarrollo inclusivo eh, de nuestros pueblos. Para terminar, solamente decir eh, que le corresponde a nuestros jóvenes una nueva etapa en la relación India-Colombia, eh, van a ser los responsables de esa implementación, de la implementación de esa nueva política hacia la Asia, la primera, como les, les, les he referenciado. Por primera vez en la historia de Colombia, eh, el principio de multialineamiento eh, del que se hablaba, selectivo y, con los, selectivo y progresivo con los países emergentes de Asia, es incorporado, aspirando a una aproximación con este continente equilibrada y justa que permita la construcción de nuevos instrumentos de integración y que seguramente lideren nuestros jóvenes para defender los valores de la democracia, de la paz, el no a la guerra y al hegemonismo. Muchas gracias. Thank you. So when I give lectures to the new foreign service recruits, I advise them to see a Colombian movie called El Embajador de la India. Hmm? The name of the film is The Ambassador of India. In this movie, there is a guy, he's a petty crook. He's traveling in a bus in a rural area and he's sleeping. He gets up and he feels like smoking. He takes a cigarette, but he doesn't have matches. So he tells the other guy, Can you phosphorus? You have matches? Yes. And then they start talking. And this guy, being a crook, he, 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 he uh, talks in a different accent. So the other guy says, oh, you speak in a different accent, where are you from? He said, yo soy de la India. <laughs> he said, I am from India. India? What are you doing here? This guy says, yo soy embajador de la India. <laughs> I am the ambassador of India. They all laugh. Hey, come on, you are kidding us. You know, and But this guy starts talking about India. We do this, we do that. I said, really? Are you the ambassador? So this guy says, yo soy embajador de la India incognito. <laughs> I am in disguise to interact with the common people. 